Hey folks, how's everybody doing? This is Stream Punk Entertainment, and this is Chatting with Awesome People. My name is Scott Churchson. Joining me is Mr. Uh, James Balsamo, filmmaker, and down below, Jersey represent here, uh, nearly 20-year basis for the band Danzig, Mr. Steve Zing. Dude, how the hell are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? Eh, not too bad. Not too bad. I uh, figure, yeah, start this off. You've been a busy dude, sir, lately, haven't you? Ah. Uh... Uh, th thankfully, yes. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing better than being busy, at least for me. So, you know, James, if you got any questions, fire away, please. I, I do. So, Steve, as a horror filmmaker, I got to know, playing in so many horror punk bands over the years, what are your top five horror movies? Uh, you know, you're going to ask me top five, but I can tell you. One of I can tell you that probably number one is an old movie called Don't Go in the House. Classic. Yes. One of my favorites. You know, uh, it's just it's got all the elements of everything. Actually, actually, you you should also check check out uh my uh and he produced it and starred in it. Nice. Uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite horror movie monster? I mean, how do you how do you go wrong with with Frankenstein and and Dracula? I mean, come on. Oh yeah, Frank I, I, I'm not going to say Freddy or anything like that, or uh, or you know Michael Myers. I, I, old school. I like, I like yeah, I like the old school stuff. Now, are you talking in this case, Bela Lugosi and uh, Boris Karloff? Or, or are you talking to me? Of course, of course, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Black and white. Mm -hmm. Scare the pants off you. Plan Nine, basically Bill Lugosi. <laughs> I love Plan Nine. I don't care. Oh, hey, you know, again, you know, I love the little spaceship that's so fake. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, talk to us a little bit about what's been going on for you lately. Oh, 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 hold on, Night of Living Dead, Oops. Dawn of the Dead. Sorry, yes, I've got those over here actually. So. Love Romero. I mean, yeah, yeah. But, can't leave those out. Right. But uh, yeah, talk a little bit about what's going on with you lately. How you doing? It's good seeing you Friday. Um, I yeah, mean, I met you at my ex-wife's wife. house. <laughs> um, and uh, I, we had just gotten back a few days before. We were in Vegas last week, a week and a half ago, for the Danzig Sings Elvis show that we've been doing, where I, I play drums in that, and and uh, we just do all old Elvis songs from the movies and stuff. So it's actually it's really cool to to play something like that uh, where uh, you really really appreciate Glenn's voice as he really croons that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite makes your hair stand up. What he's hey, a massive. Oh, go, sorry, James. Go ahead. What's your favorite Elvis song to cover? Well, are you talking about from that from that stuff? Oh yeah, man, um, uh, baby, let's play house. Um, uh, uh, pocket full of rainbows. Oh uh, man, um, just because uh, what's it? Um, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the song. There's so many because they're all just classic Elvis songs that most people don't even know. Some of you those, know, I think, are on Danzig's album from a few years ago, yes, too, right? Yes. Yeah, most of them are. Mm. Uh, but uh, it just, you know, and his interpretation of them is really, really amazing. So. Well, he kind I mean, Glenn kind of got his start and his fascination from Elvis. From all yeah, the stuff. Absolutely. Dates so, us a little bit. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll do some, a few more uh, at the end of the year, but... Uh, I'm leaving in two weeks. We have Danzig rehearsals mm -hmm. as we fly over to Poland and to Finland. And then we start a tour at the end of August. Hmm. Where's uh, the tour taking you? Uh, all over. Hmm. All over the country. So, and then we, uh, my, I have two other bands. I have Black 29, which mm -hmm. we came out with an album on Cleopatra Records on March 3rd. And that's been doing really, really good. Uh, check it out on Spotify, whatever. We have videos up on YouTube. Uh, and then my old punk band from that I started 42 years ago in high school, uh, we reunited uh, a few years ago when uh, our 
album of old material came out and we released a new EP. Got a uh, very young singer from Hasbro Kites. Nice. And uh, we are opening up for the Misfits at the Prudential Center in July. Congrats. So, and that's Morning Noise? Yes. Yeah, we're new. Yeah. So we're, you know, I'm really stoked about that. The new material, I think, is awesome. And it, and it really um, uh, kind of gives a good example of what a band could be as it progresses in life mm -hmm. without losing an edge. So uh, I'm really excited, especially for the other two guys who are original members and, you know, they've never played an arena stage before. So um, I'm excited for them. Is it going to be weird, though, in this case, opening for the Misfits, considering the, the joint history through all that? Or, well, is it just, I, or is it at this point just everybody's just connected so well? Well, you know, knowing uh, those guys for as many years as I do, and of course, Glenn, you know, they were our inspiration back in the day. Mm -hmm. So opening up for them in New Jersey in an arena is, you, you know, it it took me back 42 years when I was a junior in high school. And I'm like, it's, you know, it's, it, you know, you, it's like you made it. You, you made it to the stage, you know. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I'm I'm thankful and blessed that I get to play stages like that all the time. But I'm really, when we step on that stage and I have three guys who never played a stage bigger than, you know, a, a club. Mm -hmm. And when they get on an arena stage in front of thousands of people, I, I'm, I'm just going to be bursting with excitement as thinking about how they, they're going to feel. And my excitement as to... Wow, something that I started so a lifetime ago is come to fruition to what I always wanted it to be from the day I started playing music. Amazing. Does it ever yeah. blow your mind that it's been that long? Just by the aches and pains. <laughs> Breach. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Um, Go ahead. You know, I'm going to be 59 next month, all right? And I kind of, you know, you're like, well, you know, you're aging. But at the same time, it's not that I don't feel it. Obviously, you feel different in, in, uh, I mean, how old are you? 47. And, and you did? Uh, I'm 37. Okay, you're 37. He's a kid. He's a kid. All right. So we're basically all 10 years apart, right? So I can tell you I felt much different in 37, and I felt much different in 47 and 57, right? And it's not, not that it's a bad thing. It's a thing where if I could have told my younger self at 37 or 47 about some different things, hmm. some different choices, you know, I, I would have, I wish somebody would have, I would have listened and not that I've, I've never done drugs. I've never done, I've never smoked pot. It's not my thing. It's just, I just never did it. But uh, just certain other things, lifestyle habits, eating habits, things like that. Um, you know, it's those things that aren't taught to you that you have to figure out. And you don't figure that stuff out until kind of later in life, unless somebody can take you under their wing and really force you. For instance, right? So uh, my wife and I today, we went for uh, vitamin C uh, intravenous. Mm -hmm. uh, session and we try to do that every few months it helps your immune system and stuff like that and being around a lot of people you know you need your immun immunity up and and still with whatever covid or whatever it is out there it's you know you you can't be on the road and be sick it's really sucks so um you know i do i try to do more of a i don't want to call it a holistic pro approach but it's more of a um uh, I don't even know the word. It, it's an alternative approach, you know, so. A little more Eastern on a lot of it. Well, that stuff works. Those people live a long time. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm, uh, who knows? I mean, we don't know how long we have. We only know our birth date. We don't know, we don't know the expiration date. But, um, you know, you try to do what you can do. And, uh, you know, it comes to the point where you ask, does it ever feel, you know, do you ever feel that, you know, time has gone by? 
sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. We were at rehearsal last night and we're we're playing songs that um a lot of stuff that we're doing at the show is mostly new stuff, but the few songs that we did from 40 years ago, I was kind of smiling and I'm th- cuz it brought me back to a time. <laughs> all right? And that's where I think musically a lot of people when they go to shows they don't give bands new music as <laughs> i should say mature bands they don't give new music a shot because they they remember those bands for that period in their life when they had nothing else to think about they didn't have responsibilities they didn't have health issues and the weight of the world on their shoulders, it takes you back to your 20s, early 30s, maybe teens. And you want to hear that old music because that takes you back to that place and time where you didn't have a freaking care in the world. <laughs> and um, and that's kind of how I was feeling last night playing some of these songs. And it just reminded me when we started and we used to, you know, I, I grew up in an apartment in Lodi and we used to rehearse in my bedroom. And, you know, so it just kind of took me back and I felt like I was 18 again. You know, it's funny. Dave Grohl had talked about how shows like American Idol and The Voice and everything like that took away from what it's like to try and build out of the garage. And as he put it, suck until you get good. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I heard him talk about that. And I tend to agree. Look, you know, I have nothing against American Idol and The Voice. Uh, they're game shows. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, they're nothing but a game show. Uh, and somebody's going to win, someone's going to lose. Your life, uh, I mean, there are a few people, a bunch of people obviously came out of American Idol, uh, became superstars like, you know, Kelly Clarkson mm-hmm. and, um, uh, uh, and Clay Aiken. Whatever, whatever that lady is from that one commercial about the A1C, she came out of American Idol too. No, no, but I'm talking about the, um, um, uh, Oh, the blonde country singer. Um, Taylor Swift? No, 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 no. I have no idea. Oh, my God. I can't I, I can't believe it. Well, I know Carrie, Clay, Clay Carrie Aiken. Underwood. What's that? What's that? The Carrie Underwood? Yes, that's it. Oh, Carrie yeah, Underwood. okay. You know, so they, they, they had huge stars from there. And I don't think The Voice ever really produced huge stars. But I, I, I enjoy the shows. Uh, but again... This business is not about you getting in front of three people and they're going to judge what you're worth from a show. Because I can tell you, if any of those three judges got on that stage, <laughs> they didn't sing that well, and I'm sure they're auto-tuned in a studio to begin with. And hats off to them. That's all good. But again, it's a, it's a game show. That's all it is. It's like the price is right, but for singers. And also, in this case, from personal experience, having failed on America's Got Talent years ago, they set it up in a lot of ways to do interviews to basically program what they're going to show you to be and what they decide you're going to be. So if they decide right up front that Danzig is going to be trash, they will cater to make sure it looks that way. Yeah. Yeah. Again, if, if, you know, if it was that simple, the show would be over in one or two, you know, (laughs) two episodes, but they have to keep it going. It's ratings, it's commercials, it's all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I guess that's better than a lot of other stupid shows. I don't know. Like Milf Manor? (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) But Cheaters. Yeah. I love that show. Until I found out it was actually fake. I was like, (laughs) damn. One of my favorite shows. I can can watch, you know, the Cheaters Marathon. It's awesome. (laughs) All right, so you lost cheaters, but what else would you have out there to watch? Well, you got to go back to the to the classics of like the Twilight Zone uh, and marathons and the honeymooners, mm-hmm. right? For me, my wife, the, my wife is much younger than I am, so she doesn't get the honeymooners, and you probably don't either. But I mean, <sighs> one of these days, Alice, that marathon, <laughs> mar- marathon's usually on WPIX like every New Year, right? Exactly, <laughs> PIX. You know, you always look forward to a holiday because you know they're going to, you know, show those in, in like every episode. And my wife loves, my, my wife watched every Twilight Zone all the way up through Jordan Peele. She is a fan top to bottom in every aspect of it. So, yeah, they're, they're awesome. 
Still says the black and white's the best. Though, but... Standout Twilight Zone episode. The one with uh, where they wear the masks oh, that, yeah, that look like the what, like pigs. The surgery uh, one, yeah, yeah. That that was really cool. She's hideous. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. And then, um, uh, oh yeah, because the grandfather I think made them wear them till he died because they all wanted his inheritance and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, and then there's the one where the girls dreaming that there's like no power and it's so hot and oh, but really she was dreaming cold. it was actually yeah. really cold Freezing, yeah you know obviously the one with william shatner on the wing of the plane we're watching the 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 monster on the wing of the plane and, and things yeah. like that so there, and the one know, also used in the diner too with that fortune with that fortune teller uh yeah device. um and then the one where uh they can the guy like freezes people and like the office setting and stuff and uh, got which one that but that they they were all so cool oh yeah you know it's funny i don't think a lot of people know this but rod serling wrote the original draft for planet of the apes for the Did movie. He really? yes it's a darker version and it's available in comic book format so you can actually read somebody adapted to what he wrote to it and it has a much darker feel and it has I, a very, very serling feel to it you know, for the late 60s when Planet of the Apes came out, because I think they came out in 69, maybe? Yeah, somewhere. They came out like one year after the next for all five movies. Yeah. But so, I mean, I thought that was pretty ingenious for the way the script was. It, it makes sense that it was based off something Rod Serling because it had to do with the future. Mm -hmm. And of course, when they see the Statue of Liberty blowing up and everything... But I thought they, I thought most of them were fabulous. You know. Except yeah. the fifth one. Yeah. Worship the bomb. That's my favorite one where they worship the bomb. <laughs> that was beneath, yeah. Yeah, beneath the planet of the apes. Yes. When they get the baby doll. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, at, or no, um, and then the, the one where they're hiding uh, the, the baby with the circus. Yes. Right, and, and the, the baby starts going, Mama, Mama. <laughs> Every single one of those movies ended with like kind of a dark, dour note. Yeah, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, you blew it up, you, you blew it up. It up. <laughs> that has been parodied to death in every single facet and form at this point. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, so um, what else you got going on um, when you're when you're back in Jersey? What are you doing? Um, you know, I have a studio here that I'm sitting in. This is my recording studio okay. in my home, and I'm fortunate to be able to a write and record my own material um, for both Morning Noise Black Twenty Nine as well as the Crow Mags. I did their last EP here. I uh, just did a, a great punk band. From Jersey called Chemical X. I just mm -hmm. uh, recorded and produced them, uh, working with a few other bands. I don't advertise. I'm choosy as to who I want to work with and when I want to yeah. do it. Um, it's really a, a personal thing. I've invested in recording gear for many, many years. And of course, you have to always keep up with it because nothing, you know, computers and, and software and hardware some things always need to be you know uh redone or whatever so it's it's a constant uh work uh in motion to keep you know ahead of what's what's out there so you know but i have a separate drum room on the other side and you know where we track drums and vocals and guitars or whatever and it works so we have plenty of gear we have we have just as much gear as a regular professional recording studio. So nice. it's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. As a musician of many talents, Steve, what, what's your favorite comfort instrument to play besides the kazoo, of course? You know, I wish I could play the kazoo. Um, it's just one of those things you just, I get the same sound. You know, <laughs> but, um, you know, you know, I started off with drums. So that's, I don't want to say that's I, I'm comfortable with drums, but I'm comfortable with bass. You know, my bass playing is not the typical um, 
standard of bass playing. Glenn Danzig taught me how to play bass. I play bass for the part in Danzig. And it's a, it's a different way of, it's a different approach to playing. I, I play it more like a percussion, percussive instrument than I do a bass, right? Because it's all downstrokes and it's very heavy attack. So I, I I really approach it in a different way. Drums are everything in Danzig, dan drums and bass, because we don't use tracks. We're not a band that will ever go to tracks and and you know, like a lot of a lot of bands do, and and that's okay. Um, I, I you know uh, I admire bands that can play with tracks because sometimes they're overproduced or they're trying to to, to bring out a, the big sound that they're known for, um, and I think it's no it's no secret that Motley Crue has been using tracks for years. You know, they're, uh, they're a, they're a overproduced band and that's what makes their sound their sound. So you can't just get that from one guitar, just not going to work. But with Danzig, I think with the power of the drums and the power of the bass, the way I play it to the drums and with Tommy Victor from Prong, who's our guitar player as well, when you combine that, it is a big sound. So uh, you have to create that power in the playing in order to for it to really generate what people want to hear and expect. Nice. So um, <clears throat> cool. Uh, James, do you have anything else or anything like that? Yes. You, you did uh, have one question you wanted to ask him. What, what's your uh, what's your best inside joke with with Glenn Danzig? <laughs> After being friends with him for so long, it wouldn't be. An, we'll, we'll still be an inside joke if he says it. <laughs> I'm trying to think an inside joke. Ah oh, man, like you guys are on tour, you see something, and you look at Glenn, and you're all, ah, this fucking guy. Well, I think we do that with just about everything. Ah. Uh, you know, that's a tough one, James. I, I think knowing Glenn for as long as it sometimes, you know, we'll just say things and it just flies by us. My friend Doyle from the Misfits, you know, when uh, before the Misfits got back together, we would do these shows, Danzig and Doyle. And we would play, he would come out and we would play Misfit songs. Now, Doyle and I grew up together from kindergarten through high school, went kindergarten through high school at Lodi. And we were in the same classes. So we'd be on stage playing, he'd he'd walk by me and he'd shout like our kindergarten teacher's name, right? <laughs> and I'd look at him and I'd shout. I'm like, Do you remember Miss Sorbello? Because she was so hot. I'm like, I know. <laughs> you know, so it's all that little like little stuff that most people wouldn't get, but we got it. At five uh, years old, you got that. Uh, well, we knew Miss Sorbello, who's our third grade teacher. No, second grade. Second grade. She was hot. She was really hot. We knew it back then. We knew it back then. You know, we didn't know what was going on in our bodies, but we knew it was because of her. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Uh, I was never that lucky. All my teachers were really ugly. You're like 95 years old. Sucked ass. Yeah, cool. So what's your hat? Wolf. This actually, yeah, this, um, my wife is a veterinarian, so this was a hat that basically one of the places that she works at, I just happen to like it, it's comfortable, you know, it's obscure as heck, I think the other day when I was at, when I was at the party, I think I had a hat that said meow, so oh. it's kind of like this Judah Friedlander thing where you just wear right, like cool. hats that are random as crap, um, and apparently, yeah, some people looked at my meow hat and apparently it went over really well, so today it's wolf. Nice. So. Very nice. But yeah, so, but... Um, and James, where are you from? I'm from Queens, actually, so I'm an East Coast guy. <laughs> but, but yeah, Jersey represent in this case, so... Um, all right, Steve, I, I'll let you go. I'm sure you got stuff to do. I appreciate the time. Um, yeah, as always... I appreciate we, your time. Thank you. Uh, as always, for guests that we have on here, we do know, donate money to charity. So in this case, the charity money will be, will be going to an organization called Table to Table out of Saddlebrook that provides what is normally going to be discarded food and provides it to people in need in the state of New Jersey. So for places like the ShopRite, the supermarkets out there, maybe certain events and things like that, 
food that would normally just be tossed by the wayside. And in the U.S., I believe it's between 70 and 90 billion tons of food gets thrown out every single year. A lot of that food is still good. And as a result, they take a lot of that and they give it to people in need. So a donation will be made on your behalf to thank Table you. to Table, Saddlebrook, by the way, Jersey represent, um, as a way of saying thank you for coming on. Yeah, you, you know, I started uh, doing fundraisers nine years ago. Um, and uh, it was because I was in a, a supermarket and there was a man with his daughter that couldn't afford to pay for all his food. And I and I picked up, it was like about $30. And the woman, uh, that the cashier, she's like, I, I don't mean to, you know, get in your, I was having a conversation with the guy who was breaking down. Mm -hmm. His wife had cancer. He had lost his job. They had a newborn at home, a little girl. And, and she told him to check out some different organizations. And I went home and I'm like, I got to do something. Uh, you know, I, I grew up um, myself and my mom on welfare. We had nothing. So that kind of brought me back to a time that uh, when we would get the government bag of groceries delivered once a week and the government block of cheese and all the uh, ShopRite branded canned goods and boxes of pasta and stuff. So it, 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 it really hit home. So every, um, uh, obviously not the years of COVID, uh, but uh, every year I put on a fundraiser on Black Friday and we get some bands and we go over to Dingbats and Clifton and we put on a live event and we raise about $3,000 and then we have people that match what we make and uh, it all goes to table to table as well as um, a few other different organizations just to help people out. <clears throat> so you and I should probably talk a little further. Uh, we can do a three mail. It's fine. But talk a little bit more about that event and maybe some ways that we can do on our side to promote that event as well. That would be awesome. So absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. I, I'm a firm believer. Look, it, you know, I, I you can't rely on government and <laughs> there are people that are just down and out and everybody could use help and hopefully they pay it forward when they get back on their feet. It's yeah. not just people that are uh, lazy and alcoholics, drug addicts, as, as most people say, they must be. There are people that are just down and out and it screws them up mentally. It screws up their lives. Sometimes spouses leave them when people lose job. Who knows, right? There's all different circumstances. A lot of it is sickness. And uh, a lot of these people aren't taken care of. And if we can just put some, you know, meals on the table, maybe uh, some clothes on someone's back, uh, then, hey, you know, we're kind of ahead of the game. I figure if I can afford to eat a steak, then a few dollars is not going to hurt me and try to help someone. Nice. So that's my whole angle to it. I don't, I don't ask for... I don't say this was put on by me or anything, but, you know, I just do it and then I just donate the money and I'm, I'm not there for press releases or anything like that. But I, the more the more people we can get involved to help donate and even look, if they're not in New Jersey, if they can outreach to, you know, some organizations in their own area, why not, you know? Sure. So. But yeah, we'll definitely talk further on this. It's still a few months out, but I've got some ideas yeah. already percolating through my head. Beautiful. But I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, dude. And besides, I mean, like I said, I'm only in Lodi, so Clifton's, I can almost walk to the dingbats over here. <laughs> yeah. So, cool. Uh, James, any other final thoughts? Uh, what's your favorite song out of all your bands that speaks to you the most that you wrote? You know, that's a great question, James. I don't know if I can answer that because, you know, every band I play in, is everything's got a different meaning and to pick one song is 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 really um it's really really a hard thing to pick because there's so much that uh hits me in different ways i can't answer that question in one okay let, let, let me let me rotate it <clears throat> what's the song that you remember being the most excited writing hmm Man, what are you doing to me here? <laughs> you know, you ask great questions. You know um, why? Because I get interviewed all the time. Scott asked me to 
do this. This is my first time being an interviewer, and I always get asked the same five questions all yeah. the time. So I really wanted to take something that like hit you hard, Steve, because I always get asked the same five questions. So I wanted to make sure I gave you something good. Um, I would have to say if it's something I wrote, uh, I would say it's from Black 29, and I would have mm. to say it's a song called The Waiting. Mm. Um, it's kind of like my kind of tribute to the 80s goth type stuff, but it brought me back to a certain time. And a lot of the reviews on the album, which have been thankfully good, uh, have they tell you how the album takes you on a roller coaster ride. So check it out on Spotify and check it out from the beginning to the end, and it will take you on a roller coaster ride. Nice. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate so, it. Nice. Thank you. Steve. That's a great question. Appreciate the time, man. Thank you. You're awesome. It was good seeing you again, like I said, on Friday. Same here. That's, that was a damn good party, too. <laughs> Absolutely. And I recognize, I recognize that basement, you know. I've been no, there. I know you have. You know, mm -hmm. um, but like I said, this, it was funny because when basically we got the house from Jeff, he was all about, it's like, is there any way that I can convince you to keep the pool table? I'll throw it out. I'll break it up and throw it out. But he's like, can I convince you to maybe hold on to the pool table? Now, my entire life, my biggest dream for all the crap I, you know, that I worked for, the man cave was always like the penultimate thing for me. So this house has that. Yeah. And there was no way in hell I was letting go of that pool table, that air hockey table, that TV. I mean, this, there was no way in hell. You know, yeah. it was 40 years of shit to get to this point. And it's like, this is just the most amazing thing ever. So, yes, I know you. Awesome. <laughs> the couch is new, though. But, um, <clears throat> but dude, great. thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And basically, yeah, like I said, he's going to be, uh, by the way, also over in uh, Poland next month, Finland after that. Uh, check him out, basically. Danzig, they will be all over the country, all over the world. And Steve Zing, thank you as always. Take care. And, sir, you are awesome. Thank you. So are you. <laughs> thank you.